switch to uh, our second talk for today uh, with uh, Andy and Salvatore. Thanks, Sam. Um, so I'm going to share in. Uh, good. So, um, so when Salvatore and I were talking about, you know, the title of um, of this talk, I think I just watched Doctor Strange Love with my with my son. So we had to have the, the subtitle: How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Flat Car Container Linux. Um, but as you'll see, this is this is a story of, um, you know, the, the, an engineering challenge of replacing engines in mid-flight while maintaining a steady cruising altitude. So we'll find out a bit more about how Giant Swarm did that, um, and uh, and um, you know, kind of what what we uh, what we at Kinfolk did to to support that. So. Um, so first, first of all, so two speakers today. So I'm Andy, and I'll talk first. Um, I'm in the on the business side at Kinfolk, um, and Salva, do you just want to say hi? Hi guys. Um, so Salva will uh, will talk after me a bit more about kind of what what Giant Swarm's been um, been doing with Flatcar and um, his uh, site arrived as the engineer at, at Giant Swarm. So. Um, if you don't know of Kinfolk, we're a Berlin-based company. Uh, we have folks worldwide as well, but most, most of the team is uh, here in Germany. Um, we do a lot of community stuff as well as participating in Software Circus. We organize the Cloud Native Rejects conference, um, community days, and various other events. Um, we've been around for five years. We're a pure open source company. Um, so you know you, you don't get proprietary enterprise versions of, pro of our products. Everything we do is open source in kind of the Linux, Kubernetes um, space. And you know, we do consulting uh, projects with customers. Um, so if you cast back your mind to 2015, um, when, it, when Kinfolk was founded, uh, one of the main companies around in the, um, uh, in the container space at that point was uh, CoreOS. Uh, and in fact, just a couple of years before that, they had they had been founded with this mission to secure the internet, and uh, they started this with the concept of a container Linux. So they said, if we're going to secure things, we have to be building on a secure infrastructure, and that starts with the operating system. Um, so the first thing they said was, we need to build a minimal distribution because if your apps are running in, in containers then you don't need all of these packages that you get in, a, you know, I've heard it described as a full fat <laughs> Linux distro, right? So it reduces your dependencies. Your dependencies are packaged in the containers anyway, so you don't need them in the OS. It gives you less software to manage in the, on the base image, reduces the tax surface area, and it also makes deployment much more um, repeatable and you don't have to worry about doing like per host puppet chef scripts. Um, to set things up, the the next thing they did that was I think pretty pretty revolutionary probably at that point was to say let's take that whole uh, user section of the file system that the the core uh, OS is um, deployed into and make that immutable, and um, that really is you know as you can imagine there's a bunch of attacks on um, you know on Linux systems which uh, act, try and Subvert the operating system by installing files into the into the op operating system directory. So, um, you know, there's there was an example just last year which was specifically attacking you know Run C, so the kind of core of a container orchestration environment. And then the last thing they said was, if you look at the the exploits that actually happen in the real world, uh, most of them aren't about um, you know zero day vulnerabilities. They're about things that have already been patched that pe that people haven't updated their machines for. Um, so, making updates as streamlined and automated and like non-eventful as possible is like, a really high priority here. Um, and uh, you know, let's so let's make that completely automated and um, such that you can roll forward and roll back if there are issues. And, and also because it's a base for Kubernetes, um, they created an update operator to um, coordinate 
the update of the OS with um, uh, draining the, the Kubernetes node before that happens. Um, so they actually took inspiration for this uh, from uh, Chrome OS. So if you're familiar with how Chromebooks work, you know they're super secure in part because they follow these same um, uh, the same philosophy. That they have, uh, you know, non-writable OS partitions. They have two partitions: one for the update, uh, or the, you know, the next update that you're going to roll to, automatically downloaded. So that update mechanism is used also not just for Chrome OS, but Chrome and all Google apps. And then um, for pulling the packet, you know, the components it needs, because you need something more than the kernel still, um, they pull those from Gen 2 upstream. So, so that was basically the, the kind of heritage of CoreOS Container Linux. And CoreOS was a little company, um, got acquired by uh, Red Hat um, the end of 2017, early 2018. Um, and, you know, Red Hat has its own philosophy about operating systems and had you know, a bunch of its own Linux distros internally. And then you know, after, after that, IBM came along and acquired Red Hat as well. So kind of the, the original core OS team kind of got diluted here. Um, and you know, Red Hat uh, pretty much took some of the technologies fr from core OS, but core OS container Linux itself um, got an end of life. Um, they did have a replacement, which had the, you know, the name core OS, Fedora core OS, uh, which is a perfectly good operating system, but it's you know lacks some of these um, key characteristics of uh, the original core OS container Linux, and um, and in fact, as, as you can see there on, on their end of life notice, they they mention you know yeah there's a bunch of reasons why it might not meet your needs and container Linux, which um, is a core OS container Linux. So that's basically um, the heritage of Flatcar as, a, as an OS for running containers is it's a direct fork of CoreOS. And for a couple of years, we literally just ran um, pulling updates from upstream because it took a couple of years till the end of life really, um, really happened uh, in May of this year. And, um, and so, you know, we got all the experience in building and making releases and just kind of, you know, basically changing the name of the distro. Um, and then since May, we've been um, we've been maintaining it ourselves. Now, you might ask, why do we call it flat car? That's a strange name. Is it something to do with like squashed cars or something? Um, and uh, it's actually really appropriate if you uh, if you know the meaning, because it's basically it's that flat railway wagon that you uh, put shipping containers on. So it's um, you know, it's basically the the lightest weight um, piece of rolling stock on a in a railway system that ships containers about. So that's that's kind of a, a nice analogy. Um, so I mentioned that we've been taking it forward. So since May, um, we uh, updated the kernel. So the last kernel version of CoreOS Container Linux was 4.19. Um, so that's a pretty large jump to 5.4. Um, which is what the current stable release on, and we have 5.8 in, in alpha release. We've done 25 full releases since then. Um, so the team's really been rolling quite a lot. Um, and we looked across like, um, of all the component packages as 56 of the comp included components have been updated. And that's addressed 145 different um, CVEs. Um, we as on our team actually have uh, joined the Linux kernel security team. So you have to be approved to do that and you have to actually have a, an independent distro. So previously when we were just pulling from upstream core OS, we, we didn't actually qualify because we weren't like really rolling our own. Um, since we've been uh, uh, shipping flat car independently of upstream core OS, um, that's uh, kind of got us behind the curtain. And so we get, we get advanced uh, confidential notice of upcoming CVEs so we can we can build releases faster and and get them out. And we, you know, we're typically for high priority CVEs. We uh, we get out kind of next day um, as so, as soon as it's announced. We'll get the uh, um, the, the new release shipped uh, because we've done that work in advance. Um, we also open sourced an update server. So one of the things that CoreOS had one of their monetization strategies was they had a proprietary service for managing uh, rollouts of versions across a 
across a fleet of uh, machines. And, um, and so we actually created this, we, we based it off a, um, an existing open source project called Core Roller, um, but that was quite outdated, it had a lot of security vulnerabilities. We enhanced it with a lot of new features and open sourced it. So that's pretty cool. Um, and uh, we've, we're also making some optimized images for different uh, cloud versions. So we are, uh, this is a sneak preview because I think the announcement is probably going out tomorrow. Um, it, or it might be a little bit later today, US time. Um, but we have a, um, a version specifically optimized for Azure initially, because they have a concept of an Azure tuned um, kernel and that's, we're making that available on, uh, on Marketplace. Um, and beyond what we've done so far, I think our roadmap is pretty ambitious. There's a lot of things we want to do. Um, you know, we have this concept of the update server so there's already the concept of a node contacting a server to ask for, um, you know, what is the latest software version and should it download it? So, you know, we can kind of extend that concept to surface uh, telemetry ac across a, a fleet of, of nodes. Um, there's more platforms we want to support, other clouds like um, things like Alibaba um, and some some other clouds, and also with with as we get more enterprise deployments, we've had, you know, a lot of the bigger enterprises come to us and say, um, you know, what about this reg certification? What about FIPS um, or the CIS benchmarks and things like that? And there's a whole load of kind of work on the security side um, to get the more security conscious uh, customers comfortable. So, you know, th there's, there's a lot more beyond that. And if you're interested, let me know and we can kind of do a, you know, a more detailed roadmap deep dive. Um, but you know, lost to keep our team busy. Um, then, I mean, the great thing about Flatcar for us has just been to see the adoption from the community. I mean, in, to some extent, it shouldn't have been a surprise. There was a huge core OS installed base, um, but we didn't know how many of those would transition across. Uh, but you know, we see the the pings on the you know on the update server. Um, from you know how many nodes are requesting updates, and as you can see, basically from the beginning of the, the year, that you know that grew massively through kind of July, August, and it's still on a on an upward curve. Um, we've also seen, I mean, I mentioned supporting more platforms, and um, you know we've done work to integrate with uh, like Google Cloud and AWS and Azure, and the obvious ones, um, you know, and uh, Equinix Metal is. Um, very early uh, adopting flat car and being a great supporter uh, but there are others where like the community has just said yeah we're gonna we're gonna adopt flat car and uh, so the Kub uh, kubematics folks cube spray cops um you know all, all of those where um you know the open source community has taken um flat car and integrated it into the solution and uh, you know we've just seen a ton of um uh enterprises um you know and smaller and larger users um, adopting uh, flat car as well. So that's been great. AT&T did a blog post saying they're building, you know, their next generation cloud infrastructure on a range of technologies, including flat car. Um, we're working with the folks at, at Metro, the second largest retailer in the world, I think, um, you know, a, a bunch of, bunch of um, you know, really exciting uh, companies. And there was, I, th I think this was kind of, for me, this was like the ultimate endorsement. For those of you who uh, don't know da Darren, um, there probably aren't that many, but Darren's one of the co-founders of Rancher. Uh, he's uh, at I Build the Cloud on Twitter. And someone asked him, hey, Darren, what, you know, what would you recommend for running Kubernetes today um, as, the, as the Linux distro of choice? And, uh, you know, this was his response. Yeah, flat car's the way to do it. So. From someone who's actually like, you know, not just built Kubernetes solutions, but actually built container OSs as well, like Rancher OS and K3 OS. You know, I was super happy to have um, have him say that. Say that. Um, so that's that's flat car, and we'll kind of change gears at this point, and um, probably just quite keep going with with the um, uh, with the presentation at this point, um, and uh, and. Kind of hold Q and A for for later. So here we go. Salvo. Yes, thank you, 
Thank you, Andy. I was just uh, trying <laughs> the remote control. Uh, so thanks, for Andy, for, for this uh, in introduction. Uh, thank you guys for being here today. So what I'm going to, to, to talk today is uh, how Gens Worm embrace uh, Flutter, and we actually migrated uh, over than 2,000 uh, machines uh, uh, to Flatcar, uh, and actually we love it. We, we really, really love this 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 uh, this part. And I want to, I want actually to talk about this, this this story and how we we achieved that. Uh, for who doesn't know uh, Jensworm, Jensworm is a German company based in in Germany, but we actually spread. A bit, a bit everywhere across the Europe, and also in now uh, people joining uh, from the east coast of, of the United States. We provide uh, Kubernetes as a service, but more importantly, we focus on day two operations. You know, running Kubernetes is really it might be a, a beast after after a while. So we focus on on giving to to our customers uh, this solution where they can uh, easily. Uh, um, run Kubernetes, and of course, we help them throughout this entire journey into into containers. We have more than two hundred clusters running in uh, in in production, uh, and they are ma managed by us. The entire life cycle, the creation, destroy, uh, uh, upgrading path, it's all uh, by uh, by us. Um, we are across three main provider. I would say two public cloud, AWS, Amazon Web Service, well known, Microsoft Azure, and KVM. With KVM, we meant here to address all the kind of uh, 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 non-public -pu cloud ways to, to, to run a virtual machine. So we actually use uh, the kernel virtualization uh, from Linux and we run on top of that uh, the, our product. We have, our, we have many, really many large clusters because our customers are really big. Uh, uh, big uh, customers, and as I said, we focus on uh, on D two operation, and we provide support for twenty four uh, on uh, seven. This is uh, actually our biggest selling uh, point. Um, I want to give you, I want to provide some really small glossary. Um, you might have heard these these words uh, somewhere else. But please let me give you this small glossary because it will help you throughout this, this presentation and to understand if these terms are the same as you, you, as you might know or are completely different. We will talk about, you will hear a control plane. Uh, actually for us, uh, control plane is the Kubernetes cluster where we run Gens Worm uh, services. Okay? We have there plenty of services, API, our Apple application service, and, and so on. For provider, yes, this is a pretty like common terms, but just let me give you this, uh, uh, this short uh, terminology. Um, it's a third party service for us, public cloud or on-premises, on which provides low level uh, primitives such as uh, virtualization, networking, or data storage. And then we have tenant cluster. Tenant cluster are on-demand uh, Kubernetes cluster that are created by, uh, by customers, and our customers run on top of it their application. Um, so Genswarm, it's not really new to, uh, to containers, neither uh, to CoreOS. We embraced CoreOS uh, in, already in the 2015. Andy, a few minutes ago, um, talked already about CoreOS. CoreOS was released in 2013. Genswarm already in 2015 uh, was running CoreOS in production, in one of the first iteration of, of, of the product. Uh, the reason why we did this, um, it was uh, because we needed an immutable uh, uh, infrastructure. So one of the, you know, guys, one of the best principles out there is that you can uh, create, destroy, upgrade your infrastructure in an in immutable uh, way. And one of the perhaps most important part of this is that your OS it's small, and the, and, the, and the footprint of your OS is the most is the mo smallest as possible. Uh, otherwise, you need to bring in uh, dependencies, you know, installing packages, having Chef, Puppet, Ansible, whatever you want to uh, to install that. So, uh, among many solutions out there, that time we picked up CoreOS. 
as uh, uh, there is also an, an amazing story already. Our CTO Timo, I'm probably probably you already know, guys, is <laughs> quite popular uh, person on uh, on Twitter, and uh, uh, he, he already spoke about, about uh, the decision be behind behind that. So I will skip this uh, this uh, this part. I uh, actually here want to talk about. Uh, really, the, the, uh, up the upgrade part. Um, as I spoke before, providers. We provide uh, uh, our product into three different platforms, Amazon Web Service, Azure, and KVM. And here are the, the, the numbers, just to give you some, really, uh, the, the scaling of, 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 our, of our problems. We were not dealing with two virtual machines and, or like or a bunch. But if you count here at the end, we had uh, in production, so we're talking always in production, over 2000 of and the virtual machine. So, you know, it was not just a problem of, hey guys, oh, let's change uh, the OS and then let's, let's move on. It was no, no, a, a, big, a bigger problem. All our uh, products were running uh, a CoreOS. So once CoreOS, uh, announced the end of life, we were like, okay, what are we going to do? We need to sit and find out um, a way. Um, just to give you this, 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 this Grafana <laughs> dashboard uh, to show you I'm not lying <laughs> about the numbers and I'm not inventing uh, uh, any, any numbers here. This is it's a dashboard that summarizes pretty well uh, uh, our, our scale, our, our, all the machines that we are running, all the clusters and so on. And here, uh, right below on the, on the right, you actually see the, uh, the three main uh, pro providers. I'm addressing here in this slide a single virtual a machine for us it's a virtual machine okay just, just to be uh, to be uh, accurate we are going to see now uh, if the kind of virtual machine that that, uh, that we provide so so let's focus on the problem from amazon okay amazon web service provide as virtual machine you you know uh, Pretty probably pretty well. Uh, EC2 instances. So this is like the basic abstraction of of virtual machine for Amazon. Um, Amazon also provides an indie way to run an OS. You, the OS can be already packaged out there with an MI. This MI, okay, it's like the way how uh, how Amazon. Uh, uh, feed the virtual machine. So you can take uh, whatever kind of OS that it's already packaged into MI and, uh, and run it. Uh, for us, we, we were running CoreOS with the MI, it was published. Uh, changing from OS, from CoreOS to Flatcar was really easy in this case. Thanks to, uh, to Kinvolk, uh, they provided a, a really super handy uh, list of MI for, the, uh, for all the region in, uh, in, uh, in Amazon. And we just changed the, the MI ID. Um, you might think, okay, but what about the dependency? What about all these things that compose you know, an OS? We're gonna see in a few minutes how we we, we solved this, this problem. Um, also, one hour, uh, one hour um, customer, a big, a big customer, uh, ran uh, AWS in China. Uh, the guys didn't, not the Kingwork, uh, the Kingwork people did not have uh, the China uh, uh, account, but thanks to our amazing collaboration, we, uh, we spoke with them and say, guys, don't worry, we're gonna solve this. And we provide to the way to distribute also MI in China. So if you have, class, uh, if you need, you have the need to run a flat car in China, uh, no worry, we have created a pipeline and we distribute also MI in, in China. Uh, the result was smooth and easy, really, guys. Trust me, I, I followed the, pro the process from zero to 100 and it was really a pleasant experience to pass from CoreOS to Flatcar. Uh, this was also uh, an entire team dedicated to, to it because something that you might probably uh, uh, wondering yourself, how Genswarm we deal with different provider? Oh, we have one dedicated team per provider. So this is it's one team uh, work, but really trust me when I'm saying that it was really easy. Uh, second provider, Microsoft Azure. Well, here was a little bit more funny 
and a little bit more uh, intriguing, but nothing, nothing super complex. Uh, in Azure, we our product run into again virtual machine, and for virtual machine in Azure, we run a scale set. Okay, uh, for, for who is not familiar, scale set, it's like imagine an auto scaling group for a Amazon, uh, a, a, for AWS, okay, nothing really uh, different. But at the first run, we found out a really interesting problem. Uh, the guy, Handy has already spoke about it, uh, said that CoreOS end of the life, Kinvork arrived and start to distribute their image. Uh, but you know, when you distribute an image, uh, attach it to the image in the Azure uh, store, there is uh, um, uh, the um, uh, the publisher. Okay, so there is a publisher attached to to it, and of course it was different before. It was CoreOS now it was was Kingboard. And once we start to spin up, the, to upgrade the, uh, our cluster, then we found <laughs> an interesting message on uh, Azure uh, saying that it was not possible to up, uh, upgrade. Uh, we didn't lose our hope. We we'll stay cool and say, okay, guys, what we, we can do. Uh, our SRE, the SRE of the Azure team together, we built an automation uh, tool to change and fly the publisher. Uh, uh, from CoreOS to Kinvolk, restart the, all the all the uh, instances, and actually continue uh, to run uh, Flatcar. Um, again, keep in mind this one very important thing: everything in our infrastructure is immutable. So all of these steps were possible thanks to the fact that we uh, were running an immutable infrastructure. Um, so at the end of the day, yes, there were more steps involved, but trust me, we didn't have to write a lot of code. I'm just, just, just to be more accurate, because you might wonder, hey guys, what you really did? Uh, we wrote some bash script, <laughs> always the old uh, body bash <laughs> that helped us to change during this, uh, during the upgrade process the uh, publisher and restart the instances and actually move on with, uh, with, with Flutter. At the end of the day, solved. So we, we moved on with, uh, with the Azure. Um, let's go ahead, sorry, there is one slide. The last guy, KVM. So on KVM, we run any kind of machine that is not on public, on public cloud. So either bare metal, on top of it, we run a virtual machine, uh, VMware, so again, virtual machine, or imagine any kind of, of uh, uh, virtual machine provided by any other uh, uh, hypervisor. Um, so I spoke before we were talking about control plane. Uh, Giant Swarm control plane, of course, was running before CoreOS. So we had to, of course, migrate the control plane. And uh, um, the machine on the control plane uh, were spinning up using Pixie Boot. And now I'm not sure for who knows this this way how to spin uh, to spin machine. Basically, Pixie Boot is a way to configure a spinning up a machine, bootstrap a machine uh, by making DHCP requests to a server. And this server then provide. Uh, the entire uh, images of the of uh, uh, of the OS, and uh, in our case, was really easy. We they, I remember really well when I worked on this problem. We had to change. There was this flag, this kernel flags, CoreOS uh, enabled to flat core uh, enabled. It's it, it's a it's an, uh, a kernel flag that you you use. Uh, 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 when you, you spin up an image using the, the, uh, the kernel and the init RD. Um, so really, we had to change because of course the guys, the uh, Kingborg guys uh, thought, okay, let's of course re rename all the occurrences of CoreOS. So it was really easy. We just had to look on our GitHub and, and, and change. Um, we were, regarding the tenant cluster in KVM, we use Quimu. Quimu is again another is a solution, uh, open source solution uh, to spin up a uh, um, uh, uh, virtual machine. And for that, again, we had to change the kernel Im image that, of course, uh, Kinborg provided uh, us in their uh, official repository and change the kernel flag, rename them from CoreOS 
to uh, 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 to Flutter. Again, the process was was pretty easy. Uh, it didn't uh, uh, um, took us too much time to uh, to upgrade. Uh, but of course, all of this, as I, as I said before, was po was uh, possible because our infrastructure was immutable. So we didn't depend to anything external. We did not need anything uh, uh, in uh, on our uh, machine that has to be uh, uh, bootstrapped during during the load. Um, but of course, this was possible now thanks to one super handy. Uh, tool that uh, it's incorporated into uh, uh, into Flatcar. Uh, for who comes from CoreOS uh, ecosystem, this tool might be already uh, well known. But for who uh, doesn't know Ignition, Ignition is a component built into into the uh, OS that basically at the runtime read a handy JSON file. Actually, you can pass also YAML, but you know, the JSON in the YAML in a certain way, they are interchangeable. Uh, and thanks to Ignition, you can configure basically each part of the system. Imagine any kind of part of the system you can con configure. Uh, disk, file system, um, uh, user, SSH, uh, you can attach disk. You can really do many, many, many uh, things. Um, for instance, our just an example, our Kubelet or our Kubernetes uh, binaries, they are spinned up as a unit. Okay, so we define a system D unit, we define into, into Ignition, and then we, we run. And the most important things here that probably it's, it's like the key of this entire journey is that our Ignition at 90%, it's completely agnostic from uh, the provider. So we do not have many if else, if it's AWS, do this, if it's Azure, do, do, do that. You know, when you start to think about a provider, you might say, okay, but this emission will be huge and it will be full of branches. Uh, not at all. Our emission, it's at 90% completely agnostic. The 10% is just some uh, system D unit that we use to do some small operation like attaching a disk. For instance, in KVM, we use an FS server to do some uh, attaching, but the rest is just system D, D unit and the rest. And this was the, the, the entire, uh, like, I think the, the, this in this component helped us a lot to solve to solve this uh, this problem. Of course, uh, customers. Customers were, were, were actually the, the the best part because customers. Uh, we are driven actually by customers. Uh, we uh, listen to them uh, a lot, and we try to be a one hundred percent transparency on our roadmap, on our task, and whatsoever. So when, of course, we said. Uh, Time before, okay, guys, we have to change OS. At the beginning, there was, I have to be honest, there was a bit of uh, of, um, of fear. Uh, they, they were skeptic, some of, of our customers, because they say, okay, another OS, this means we need to go through uh, um, uh, an approval pipeline, we need to see what, who does this OS. And of course, the security, who maintain the security? If there is some issues, some package in, into the OS, it has some, you know, some flow or some security patch, who, who push this? So there were a, a lot of questions uh, arising from our customer, which of course pay our bill and, and we, we, we need to reply to, to them. Uh, but we sit together and I remember with, uh, with uh, my COO, Oliver, and with the CTO, Timo, we, we start to, uh, to put everything black and white. And in a couple of weeks, I remember two weeks, we uh, put everything clear. And we said very clearly, Flatcar, it's not a new OS, it's a drop-in replacement for uh, for CoreOS uh, and explaining them very well in papers. What does this uh, mean? How the security is, is, is it treated and, and, and so on. We also show them the release process. The uh, Kimborg made a great release process uh, showing every kind of tool that they use. There is basically almost, I believe nothing, uh, a secret or nothing, non-open source. It's everything there. If you want to know how it works, you just there, you ask. They are really a great in a, in a reply. 
so yeah, so the customers was 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 a fun part, but uh, trust me, was also was was the best part of of these, because we learned also uh, uh, a lot. Because for us, for, for our technical, we were saying okay, but no worries, there will be no. No, no, no fear from a customer, but actually this was not true. There was a a, a, a bit of of uh, of friction, but we 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 really solved it. We solved it with our also with our solution engineers explaining them uh, our our path, our upgrade uh, path uh, very very well. Um, today this is this is the scenario. Look, uh, just to show you pretty clear in a nice image. Uh, what we achieved. Uh, if you see the X axis, you will see uh, that from July we were almost 40%, not super well. And then in the last, uh, in, in August during our <laughs> summer holidays, uh, we really uh, smashed uh, the CoreOS and we said goodbye uh, to CoreOS. And almost now it's the graph says 100, but yeah, there are, I have to be honest with, with you. In the next slide, there are, oh, there are the remaining five uh, machines uh, running CoreOS, which I believe they are not uh, business critical. They are just probably some batch, uh, some instances to run some batch stuff or so on in all our um, our providers. Um, again, this was possible thanks to the great. Uh, uh, sponsorship that we, we have together with, with the Kinbok. Uh, we have also a channel to, to speak together where we uh, talk about our our problems, our issue, and they are super helpful. They always reply uh, to all our questions and they really follow the, the, uh, the, the our issues from zero to uh, uh, 100. And throughout this, this, this path and also in the future, this sponsorship will help us uh, a lot. There are a lot of new things uh, coming. Just to mention <clears throat> some of them, uh, we are building uh, our product. Uh, it's uh, it's done on releases, so we are building uh, uh, conformance uh, test in Tecton in in Prow. They are all public, open source. Uh, as uh, Ping me if you need, if you want to see behind the curtains how, how the things work. Um, there are, we are testing also new hypervisor. Um, of course, as I said before, we are running, uh, we create like tenant clusters in uh, on-prem with Quimu, but we are also experimenting and launching Firecracker machine. And uh, of course, this was not possible to do if we didn't, uh, didn't have the opportunity to work together uh, very closely with, uh, with Kinvolk. They helped us a lot to set up all the kernel parameter, to recompile the kernel also, because there were, there were some modules that were not uh, uh, supported. Um, and of course, with the newest uh, uh, um, release of Flatcar, as you might already uh, saw, or perhaps you will see later, there is the new kernel, 5.4, 5.6, and so on. And this takes into so many improvements into the C group uh, and, and virtualization layer. And of course, for, for when, when you run a virtual machine and you, you run containers, these are the, probably the most important features out of, out of, of, of the kernel. And Flutter also has some nice really uh, uh, Easter egg, I would call. Um, it also has built-in support for Wildcard and we might uh, uh, take a look into it and we might change all the, our entire uh, IPsec uh, tunnel and, so, uh, and replace with, uh, uh, with the WireGuard, which is this new uh, kind of new, I would say, uh, um, security layer uh, uh, protocol to, to, uh, to build a security layer. So basically, at the end of the day, to provide a VPN, which for us, it's one of the most, uh, one of the most important things, but I believe for many, many organizations uh, out there. Um, um, so yes, yeah, so please, please ping me if you want to know more about this. I can share uh, a lot of materials about each uh, each point, but it's like ninety percent, ninety five percent of this. It's completely uh, open source on our GenSwarm uh, repository. Um, yes, I have done. If you have any questions, guys. 
Thank you both very much. It's very enlightening. Thank you, sir. Um, there's um, a quite lengthy question from Jerome uh, Petazzoni uh, once more in the chat. Uh, if you have access to it, uh, that'd be great. If not, I can uh, do my best to uh, to render it. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm reading right now. Yes, I told you. Uh, you replaced the OS imagine and then rebooted to the new image. Can you clarify which one is it? Uh, uh, in For which provider are uh, you are uh, talking, Jerome? Uh, AWS, Azure, or uh, KVM, because I spoke about three pro three different provider. Oh, so sure. Maybe you could ask answer for each. Wow. Okay. Yes. Uh, so yes, once yeah, once again, uh, in case of AWS, we our um, product is a package. It comes out with. A, a, with, uh, uh, for instance, on, yeah, in case of AWS, we have AWS um, uh, cloud formation temp template, okay? And in cloud formation, we, uh, we, we define auto scaling group. And in the auto scaling group, we define, there, there is the possibility to define the launch configuration. And in the launch configuration, you define the um, MI. So we, we basically change that and then, uh, uh, did the up, uh, upgrade. Uh, this is for AWS, uh, if, I, uh, if I'm answering to your question. Then uh, for Azure, oh, we uh, swap the image uh, uh, changing from CoreOS to Flatcar, uh, uh, but also we had to make, as I said, a script, some, some scripting to manage this, this process. Because if you do this, if you run a an, an virtual machine uh, scale set with, uh, uh, with um, images provided by a publisher, you cannot take a different publisher and upgrade the same uh, virtual machine scale set, it will return an, an, an error, Azure, to just error, error out. Um, uh, and then for KVM, um, yes, I spoke about the, the, the two problems, uh, one on the, uh, on the control plane, which is this big uh, Kubernetes cluster that we, where we run our products. And we had to provide uh, uh, to the nodes, uh, the newer kernel, uh, uh, the, the, the compressed kernel that Tim Bork provide, and the init already uh, com compressed. And uh, uh, once we, we, we had this, we changed these, uh, the images, and we restarted the images. We, uh, sorry, we restarted the node of the control plane, uh, the, the newer uh, OS, uh, Came, came, came up. Um, yes, I believe, I'm not sure if this is re replied to all your question. Um, uh, yes, I'm reading. No, it does, thanks a lot. Thanks yeah, well, of course, uh, feel free to ping me. I can show you, I can show so much material about, about this, this part. Uh, definitely one hour is not <laughs> enough. Um, uh, yes, because also I didn't tell you, but we also run everything in a Kubernetes operator. So there is this reconciliation period where we uh, restart the node. And so but it, be it becomes slightly more complicated, but there is no sense to put into this discussion this, this complication. But yeah, we can have this, uh, this, uh, this talk completely separate. OK, Mr. Thanks a lot. You're welcome, Jerome. Um, Dimitri uh, is asking, you're not using Nebraska to upgrade the platform. <laughs> that's, that's nice. No, uh, no, no, I mean, um, we have uh, our, um, our, in, in our uh, own product internally, we use our own uh, upgrade pipeline, which is uh, a bit older than, than, than Nebraska. Uh, uh, so yes, so oh, it's not easy just to pull off everything, just to say goodbye to this pipeline that we have in house and replace with uh, with a new uh, a new a newer tool. Definitely, we always are 
work to make this pipeline better and we always look around to any kind of solution that makes our work easier and uh, operational <laughs> speaking less because it's not fun of course uh, if you have manually in SSH into machines and say what is this and what is that and so on so but yeah for now no we are not using um, I had a question, Salvo. So, yeah, sure. you mentioned release con releases conformance tests. What are you, what are you actually testing in there? What are you testing conformance to? Yes, we are testing uh, basically um, uh, in case of it. For for now, we are working only on AWS. And for uh, release, um, we are basically spin up our cluster. Okay, so the, um, our cluster come up from. Uh, from make, making a request to the AWS operator that we, uh, we that we run, and we basically have a kind of uh, uh, of bullet list where we sign uh, all the all the things that comes up correctly. We test the CNI. Uh, we test the if, if the IP range it's correctly inside any kind of of, uh, of subnet that we have to. Uh, uh, set in uh, we also set up yeah of course ingress uh, this is very important for us um, um, and then uh, lately there was also some some work around um, application because now we, we provide to our customers also the possibility to install their own application from a catalog that we provide okay so we provide for instance if you want to install grafana and prometheus you can click install grafana and prometheus and then we, we test this 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 part specifically there is nothing connected to uh, uh, to flatcar but of course flatcar the os is an important part because if any kind of system the unit doesn't come up we of course say, say in the, uh, sign the mm -hmm. uh, uh, conformance test uh, failed and yeah, we have to check. Thank you very much both. Anybody else has, uh, have questions for either Andy or Salvo? Andy, what is the future of the edge channel? Because it looks pretty useless at, uh, for the last uh, couple of months, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was a nice idea when, when CoreOS was still around. <laughs> um, it's a it's a good question, and um, uh, so we've been yeah we've been pretty busy like improving the uh, the release infrastructure and getting the team more efficient. But it's still kind of the paces of releases in the main alpha and beta and stable channels of have basically kept them busy and we haven't had the bandwidth to get a, a new edge release out. I think we will get another one out. Um, and, you know, th there's definitely are things that go into that, that um, people can experiment with that we probably wouldn't want to like put in the main, um, into the, the main kind of build pipeline, because if we put something into alpha, there's, there's an expectation that it, it goes to beta and an expectation that that goes to stable. So kind of once it goes in, it's, it's going through. The idea with Edge is people can experiment, we can put features in and it's there's no commitment that that becomes a production feature. Um, so uh, so I think it does still have some life, but it'll, it's going to be a, a bit sporadic, I think. Uh, releases may come out, they may not. Um, but... The other, the other discussion that we keep having is around just the term edge, because that used to mean something different to what people tend to think of it today. So, um, you know, the idea was it was kind of the cutting edge uh, release with, you know, latest experimental things in. And today people say, oh, so that's your, that's your operating system for edge, is it? And, um, and so there's kind of a naming problem with it as, as well. Um, so, so yeah, I think it's going to stay around. Um, there are some people who, who like it and I'm hoping to get a new, a new update, um, out soon. What, uh, CNI are you running on giants for with IPsec tunnels or, or none at, or no overlay at all? 
Yes, this is a good question. Thanks, Dimitri. Um, so, um, okay, let's start with AWS. In AWS, we have a combination of uh, AWS CNI plus Calico to, man to maintain security policies. Then moving to Azure, we have um, uh, Calico again um, for security policies and, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, the Azure CNI, but this is still like under consideration, but we mainly use Calico. Uh, and then on KVM, we have fully Calico for the moment, but we might revisit these uh, this, this part. Um, for AWS, we embrace AWS CNI because for our, our customers, they run, as I said, many, many uh, clusters, they had to possibility to uh, interconnect each other. And when you have uh, a CNI that speaks almost directly with the underlying uh, networking, which is the AWS VPC, AWS CNI looked the most obvious uh, solution in, uh, uh, in the AWS. Uh, so yeah, we, we picked up that. And then we, of course, remained uh, a bit like um, uh, close to to, uh, to Calico to maintain all the security policies because for, uh, for many customers having security policies, network security policies, uh, it's super important. So they had to uh, close uh, connection across namespace and so on. So it was a, a must. Yes. So this is the combination. Does this reply, Dimitri, to your question? Uh, yes, thanks. Yeah, we mostly use Calico. We do use Weave for some that wanted uh, the encryption. And I know Calico is starting to support the wire guard. So uh, <laughs> want to move to that part because the IPsec tunnel, uh, well. Yes, there is a lot of look, discussion. Look kind of a, a, strain, yeah, a, 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 a burden. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of discussion this is going on right, right now. There are a lot of SIGs that we run inside the uh, company. Uh, if if uh, and when we need to put our CNI on top of of uh, of wireguard and running along with that, we there are still like discussions and there are some um, uh, uh, requests from customers that they came uh, in um, the past months. But yeah, we we will see.